My wonderful students, let's uh, get going with lecture. You guys ready? Yo, you guys ready? Okay. All right, let's go. A um, couple things I want to mention to you. The homework nine had some images, I think one of the boxcar images. And, you know, it's, it's hard to predict uh, Canvas. Uh, it can be a pain, especially if you're using Safari on a Mac. OS system. And I, matter of fact, I do almost 99.9% .9 of my computing on Mac OS. And uh, I use Google Chrome for uh, web courses. I don't use Safari anymore, hardly ever. Because it's, you know, the, the image is there. You know it's there. I put it in there. I saw it five minutes ago. And then when I reload the page, I can't see it. And that ha seems to happen in Safari a lot. I don't know what the reason is. And apparently it was happening in Google Chrome. I don't know the reason for that. You know what the reason might be? Uh, I don't know. Where was that guy that was asking me about it? Anyways, uh, it's possible that it's be if, if you live in an off-campus uh, apartment complex like... What's that one right across the street? The where where like the Bar Louis and this plaza. Yeah, so if you live in one of those places or up and down Alafaya somewhere, a lot of times what I have heard is that the internet service provider will totally lock out an entire floor or an entire wing of the apartment complex if they catch somebody spamming or something like that. They'll, you know, that, and so my guess is that there's some kind of a, a cash issue, caching issue um, at some of the off-campus dorms that you don't see on campus. But in, in the event that that happens again, uh, what I want you to try to do is alert me in discussions and say, Dr. B, the image for number six on homework 11 or whatever it happens to be, is not showing up. And what I'll do is I'll put this the same image into that discussion thread so you can see it there. And I'll attempt to put it into uh, the, uh, the homework again. And, uh, tr and try to do that. Try to alert me in discussions uh, before you burn your last attempt. So that if I can get that image in there... And a lot of times the images are just, you know, just to, you know, like give you a picture of, you know, like a hockey, somebody playing hockey. I mean, there was a hockey rink picture in Homework 9, I know. And uh, uh, sometimes the box scars are just, you know, you can get from the text what's also in the picture. Uh, and the same with the blobs of jello out in space. You actually didn't need the, the diagram to to figure out what was happening. But it, of course it helps, that's why I put them in there. So anyways, try to alert me to that. Um, another thing I wanna mention, some of you have changed your NIDs, so I'm probably gonna try to upload your, uh, excuse me, you've changed your NID, changed to your NID in the uh, Great River website. And so I'm probably going to try to upload your chapter two mini review uh, from there into web courses. Okay. And uh, hopefully that'll be this week sometime. Um, another thing I uh, mentioned in discussions, mentioned last time, uh, I put up a clicking roundup number for everyone, uh, everyone that has a registered eye clicker, that is. Some of you don't have it, but uh, so look, a number that looks like this. Now, most of you have uh, almost all the questions answered, so, but this is for some, it's a little bit lower. This means that in the hundredths and the tenths decimal places, 
That encodes the number that you have answered. This is the class participation part. So this student has answered 17 out of 22. And right now in this class, as of last Thursday, the end of class Thursday, we had 22 questions on the books. All right. And so I, it's going to be a, a little bit bigger now uh, after today's class because we've got a bunch of questions. Get your clickers out if you haven't already. Um, the other number, the whole number part, tells you how many you have correct. So the class participation grade comes out of the decimal fraction part of your roundup number. All right, so always remember that. And, you know, go s divide 17 by 22, and if it's above, you know, divide whatever you have by, you know, whatever the base number is, um, and then, and I'll always announce what the base is. Right now, you guys have uh, 22, and the other class has 23, but you guys will eventually even out, probably by the end of this week. I'll try to give you guys one more question than the, you know, the morning class. Um, so your 25 out of 25 participation comes out from the decimal part of that number. And then your end of semester performance bonus comes out of the whole number part. Another thing I want to make a mention to you about is I noticed some of you have pretty low numbers in clicking. And somebody uh, messaged me over the weekend, Dr. B, how come I... Roundup number is so small because I'm here for it. And I asked the student, well, where are you, do you, you know, is your clicker working? Yes, it was working. And then I asked, where do you sit in lecture? And she said, well, I usually sit all the way in the back. And as I've mentioned before, uh, the, the, the clickers, especially the batteries, are very, very cheap. It's a little cell phone, but it doesn't have a very big range. You know, just a few, you know, a dozen, a few dozen meters. So, you, in other words, you can't use it. Unfortunately, you can't sit over in, in, the, in, in the student union and use your clicker all the way over here. It won't reach that far. But it also, I, you know, you guys in the back, I've warned before, you know, you sit back at there at your own peril. And I, you know, if, if I don't pick you up, I don't pick you up, you know, and... You know, it's, you know, you know, I can't, you know, I can't uh, be any more clear about it than that. So you decide what you want to do in terms of seating moving forward or not. Uh, okay, we're going to talk a little bit about molecules today. We have a molecule, uh, one molecule homework that we're going to review in lecture today. Uh, here's ammonia. Uh, this is a model of ammonia. Here's an image of a bunch of benzene molecules, three of them, kind of chained to, together with covalent bonding. This is an actual image, a di what, what, what we would call a direct image. This is not a model. It's a special kind of um, microscope called an atomic force microscope. And they've just been able to start doing this in the past four or five years. And previous to that, you could always tell students, you'll never see a picture of an individual atom because they're just too small. Not anymore. Now these are, you can see the individual atoms. These are these hexagonal shaped objects. That's what we call the benzene ring. And this is a set of them bonded together uh, as a molecule. Uh, here's another molecule, ascorbic acid, vitamin C. Uh, and uh, this one's even bigger than that other one. Uh, and we're going to talk about this problem right now. So take some notes if you got tripped up on that one. I know some of you were asking about it. Um, it's the interaction between um, a green triangular molecule and a yellow uh, Pac-Man shaped molecule called H uh, and they interact together um, and uh, 
So what I want you to realize is that that molecular interaction, it's kind of idealized. There's no molecule that actually looks like that. Uh, but it's, it's um, basically the same as one boxcar moving into a chain of five, just like in this diagram here. All right, so keep that in mind. The only difference is that the uh, mass unit for that homework problem wasn't kilograms or thousands of kilograms. You know, 1,000 kilograms, that's also known as a metric ton, which is different from uh, an English uh, ton. But a metric ton is 1,000 kilograms. Uh, but the, the homework problem was uh, molecular mass units. Now that's, that's my made-up unit, MMU, molecular mass unit. We're going to talk about the real uh, unit of mass today that they use in atomic physics. So uh, get your clicker ready. Let's do a, a clicker question uh, together. We're, and we're actually going to work through this problem. Um, an example of it uh, from homework nine. Um, and here it is. The, and just make a note that the green delta molecule, the triangular shaped one, it has one molecular mass unit of mass. And I didn't tell you what the size of the molecular mass unit was. I just said MMU. And the, the, the yellow H molecule that's going to absorb it has five molecular mass units. Now, the initial speed of the delta molecule is, in, in the example that we're going to use, 12.3 meters per second. Uh, and the uh, yellow H molecules at rest. So it's kind of an idealization. Uh, but let's, let's do this calculation step by step. Okay. So if you got tripped up on it, uh, which I know a few of you did, um, let's go through it step by step and kind of sort out the pieces. All right. So here we go. First question. The initial speed is 12.3. What's the momentum of the delta molecule in this weird unit mmu meter per second so we're not using kilogram meter per second we're using mmu meter per second so go ahead and answer that and hopefully you guys will get this part right on the money Boy, I have a headache. Hope I'm not getting a migraine. 20 seconds. Ten. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Boy, we have good attendance today. 206 people just answered. That's great. Um, yeah, 12.3 is the correct answer on that one. Yeah, it's just MV. P equals MV. Now, Let's see if you guys are smarter than the 9 o'clock section. Question number two. Read very carefully. There's the completed hex molecule down in the lower right. It's moving off at a new speed. But what's its, mo what's its momentum? after the interaction. We're going to get to speed in just a second. What you want to do right now is figure out its momentum. And do not let me catch you napping the way I did the, way I did the 9 o'clock class. They were napping big time.
Daniel, I have your printout up here. You can get it after class. So you don't get shut out this weekend. Twenty seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Nice. Two th two hundred and nine students. Um Oh my goodness. It looks like we got some splaining to do because you can see that there's a variety of answers. A bunch of you, uh, hardly anybody voted for A, uh, but a, a good smorgasbord of people voted for B, C, and D. Nobody voted for E. There is no E. Uh, so let's talk about this. Um, let me go back to the laptop. And uh, the answer here, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to give you the business or anything, but it should be like automatic. The momentum afterward is the momentum beforehand. So whatever you had beforehand, you have it afterwards. Um, and the principle for that is conservation of momentum. All right. Now, that means that option B, okay. Um, yeah, so try to remember that. Uh, conservation of momentum. Now, C, well, let's take a look at some of these equations here. Here's your next one. This is kind of an... This is like an equation matching question, but a deluxe form of it. Okay, now which equation matches conservation of momentum and definition of momentum? You know, definition of momentum, P equals MV. All right, so go ahead and read carefully and think. Twenty seconds. Make a decision. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Wow, two hundred and ten people voted. Nice. Uh, let me see what you guys got. Ooh, uh, a couple of you voted for uh, equation A, and the uh, actual correct answer is equation B. And now the reason for that is the if you look at the right hand side. Here's your big string of box cars. Remember, I said that this problem is like a box car problem with one plowing into five, becoming six that move off to the right at a slower speed. All right. So there's your big string of box cars. Instead of 140,000 kilograms, you got six MMUs. And then over here, you have the original amount 
of momentum. Now, equation C is tempting because equation C, let me get my cursor over here. Here we go. Equation C, there's your big box car, big string of box cars, but this, no. That that's multiplying the initial momentum times six. You don't do that. You just copy, ditto marks for the initial and the final momentum. All right, so that's always going to be 12.3 on the left in this particular uh, case. All right, so uh, another thing I want to mention to you, and this is kind of why um, I can introduce these hokey, uh, Fakey units, MMU, molecular mass units, they cancel out. I mean, they cancel out here, uh, left and right, or if you go down here uh, to the bottom, uh, they cancel out uh, as well. So uh, the answer there, hopefully you figure this out too. Anybody calculate it out, 2.05? Good, a couple of you. Good, good practice. Um, so yeah, 2.05 is just 73, or 12.3 divided by six. Uh, so that's that. Let me pause for questions about this uh, homework exercise. Okay, let's keep going. Um, this is a picture of another molecule. This is retinal. And retinal is um, an important molecule physiologically. Retinal is the molecule that in your eye, in the retina of your eye, they call it retinal because it's part of your retina. It's in the rhodopsin. Rhodopsin is a protein. And this is part of the rhodopsin protein. A photon of light, a particle of light, comes through your, the lens of your eye and into the retina. When it hits this molecule, the molecule flicks. It bends and unbends very quickly. And every time it bends and unbends, it triggers the optic nerve. And you got zillions of these retinal molecules. You know, you have all those rods and cones in, the, you know, in your retina that you've heard about. And there's all kinds of retinal in there. And every time they get hit by a photon of just the right kind, a red photon, you know, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet, all the visible colors, um, it'll go bing and it'll, it'll flex and then it'll relax. And then when it gets another, mo uh, another photon of light, bing, it'll flex again. And then it will relax. Or it'll extend, and then it'll relax. Uh, and that's how the optic nerve, and then your brain organizes all those nerve impulses. And you figure out, well, I'm looking at, you know, whatever you're looking at. You, you know, you visually recognize. It's amazing to think about it. You know, that. Anything that you look at, you know, like a plate of shrimp, you know, another person, your phone, you know, a basketball, a space alien. Uh, it's really, the, re the reason you know is because the zillions of these retinals are, you know, blipping and blapping back and forth and just... And, and all those electrical impulses go into your brain, and bingo, you recognize it for what it is. Now, in the order of mo molecules and atoms, the mass unit that we customarily use is not the Dr. B made up phony baloney MMU. The real um, atomic mass unit is called the atomic mass unit, AMU. And it's roughly the size of... Um, a proton's mass. Now, we, we do the um, atomic mass unit um, instead of using kilograms or grams, if we're talking molecules. Now, if we're talking, uh, you know, a bottle of Mountain Dew, then, yeah, we use kilograms for that. 
if we're talking about um, uh, the space shuttle or the space station, we use yeah, kilograms for that. If we're talking about stars, we actually use the, um, the mass of the sun. Um, so a given star, a big star, might be two or three times the mass of the sun. That's, that's the astronomical unit. But for atoms and stuff, yeah. And it, the, the periodic table encodes all that. So for instance, you know, here's oxygen. You know, this, this rectangle shows typical uh, entry for oxygen in the periodic table. Eight protons in the nucleus. That's what the H stands for. That's its chemical identity. Everything that has eight protons in the nucleus behaves like oxygen. It is oxygen. And, um, so, but hydrogen, it just has one proton in the nucleus. That's it. And so the atomic mass unit of or the atomic mass of hydrogen is just 1.0. And if you look on the periodic table, that's what you'll see. Oxygen, oxygen is 16 because most oxygen in the universe has eight protons and eight neutrons in the nucleus. Now we don't really factor in on the mass of the electron because it's so small. Make a note of it. The mass of the electron is about 2,000 times smaller, one two thousandth of the mass of a proton. All right. So if an electron were a kilogram bottle of water, a liter bottle of water, uh, a proton would be a metric ton, a thousand liters of water. So it's a lot bigger in mass. Uh, so eight protons, eight neutrons, and that just about wraps it up. And you can see it on the periodic table. That number is about 15.99. Now, in nature, there are other things. There are other versions of oxygen. Some have 17 objects, nine neutrons in the nucleus, and eight protons. Some have 10 neutrons in the nucleus and eight protons. It's the, you know all oxygens are eight protons in the nucleus. Um, the one with nine neutrons has an atomic mass of 17. The one with 10 neutrons, and it's called an isotope, I-S-O-T-O-P-E. Uh, the isotope with 10 neutrons in the nucleus and eight protons uh, has an atomic mass of 16. But they're pretty rare, a few parts per million. Uh, but, you know, we can, we can find them. You know, there's, there's isotopes of hydrogen and stuff, too. And, you know, most elements have isotopes. Now, retinal, the atomic mass unit, or the mass of the retinal molecule, is about 284 AMUs. That tells you how many neutrons and protons, basically. It doesn't tell you the arrangement of them. You know, the chemical formula would tell you the arrangement. Uh, but just the, the mass number doesn't. But the mass number is important. All right? And we're going to do a clicker question here in a second. And you're going to figure out the momentum of retinal, whose mass is 284 AMU. So if, if we took each of these kind of atoms or molecules and got them up to one meter per second, you know, that's about two point something miles per hour, uh, hydrogen would have a momentum of 1.00 AMU meters per second, all right? And you could read that right off the periodic table. All right, so um, one AMU meter per second is the same as this number of kilogram meters per second because an atomic mass unit is about 1.66054 times 10 to the minus kilograms and I always have to look that up, so don't worry about memorizing that. But just remember, atoms and molecules, let me just stay with AMUs. And then I don't have to worry about all that scientific notation. But I mean, eventually, you know, you might have to, you know, if you're in chemistry class, you'd probably have to deal with it. And we're going to have to deal with scientific notation, but not quite yet. Um, so oxygen, uh, at one meter per second, a single oxygen uh, atom... 16.0 uh, AMU meters per second. And then retinal would be 284 AMU meters per second if it was going one meter per second. Now it's going some other speed. It would be, uh, uh, excuse me, 
That was a yawn. <laughs> if it were going some other speed, it would be 284 a.m. use times whatever that new speed is. All right. So uh, just to uh, reemphasize these two numbers. Um, and you can write them down just to remind yourself, yeah, it's, if somebody asks you, well, how small is it? Just point to this part of your notes. It's this small, the atomic mass unit. But you won't have to worry about calculating it. But I do want you to calculate something. So here's your next clicker question. You ready? A photon. A photon is a particle of light. And in a lot of, a, a lot of its properties, light can be thought of as, you know, little particles, little BBs of carrying momentum and energy. But the interesting thing about the photon, it doesn't have any mass. It's massless. 0. 0.00000, as many as zeros as we can find. We just have never found anything for the photon. It's perfectly massless. All right, so it delivers 71.0 AMU meter per second of pure momentum into a retinal molecule. All right, so this is the box. This is like a boxcar interaction, except we have a massless boxcar. You know, plowing into a, a string of 284 units of mass. And it's initially at rest in the retina of your eye. How fast does the retinal move after absorbing that photon? All right. So go ahead and calculate that. Uh, and hopefully it's not. And this is a, a multiple choice. The correct answer is on there. And actually, let me start the question. All right. And I want you to think carefully. You know, so the mass of the system afterwards is not changed. It's still a retinal. It's still 284 AMUs. But now it's moving. And what you want to figure out is how fast is it moving now? Uh, if, you, if you're a little unsure of yourself, it's all right. We're going to work out step by step after you type in your, in your question and your answer. What is spirit splash? Is that coming up? Anybody? Know? What is spirit splash? You don't know? I thought, well, you guys, don't you guys go to that? Of course, this class is never going to be dismissed because of spirit splash. Because we, we dismiss at 12... But I've had classes, I just, oh, okay, you guys go to Spirit Splash. Afternoon classes. I could not justify getting in the, that big pool of water, though, with all those other people's stinky feet in there. No way. Twenty seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Uh, okay, a plurality of you answered correctly. Um, correct answer. Well, let's figure it out. Uh, everybody, take notes because uh, most of the class answered incorrectly. 42% of the class answered correctly, so that means the majority were incorrect. Um, so here's what we've got. Delta, the, the delta P of the molecule comes from the photon, 71 AMU meters per second. All right, now, the thing about that, the final is what we want, 
in order to figure out the, the new velocity, um, the initial is fairly easy because that's zero because it starts at rest. You know, and most of the time, except for that one homework with the two blobs of jello in space, um, you don't have a zero. But most of the time, I'm going to start you from rest or end at rest or something like that. Come to a stop. Uh, so PF minus zero, zero. So all of the um, momentum goes into the final momentum. All right, so the photon delivers 71, bang. And so my 284 mu mass um, retinal molecule gets all of it. Okay, and so the final momentum over here on the left uh, is equal to uh, 284 amus times whatever the new velocity is. Right, so if the photon comes in, uh, Desiree, from left to right and it slams into the molecule, then the molecule is going to go off at some new speed. It's not going to be very fast because it's got a lot more mass than the amount of momentum. So the speed is going to be less than one. Matter of fact, you can look at the table of answers a b c d and e and if you know it's less than one there's only one answer there that's less than one 0 0.250 here it is just clear the right hand side v subscript f equals 71.0 amu meters per second divided by mass of the retinal and uh and there you go 0 0.0250 so make a note of that this is another variation on the boxcar interaction where the incoming boxcar doesn't have any mass, but it does transfer. And that's one of the cool things about light, electromagnetic radiation. It transports uh, energy, momentum, and information across space-time, but it doesn't have any mass. And even though it doesn't have any mass, you know what Sir, the Albert Einstein figured out? He said, he figured out light will also respond to the gravitational field of any object, like the sun. It'll curve around the sun if it comes really close to the sun. And a black hole, it'll curve, a photon will really curve strongly around a black hole. Something like the sun, much weaker, we can measure it. In fact, matter of fact, that was his first uh, observational verification of the theory of relativity was finding light curve, measuring light curving around the sun. We, you know what we call it now? Gravitational lensing. Question? Mass of the retina. That's the mass of the boxcars that started at rest. And now they're moving, 0 0.250. And so this is the boxcar variation where the initial boxcar doesn't have any mass. You know, the one that plows into it. You know, we started Thursday with, you know, all four of them the same. You know, uh, I think it was 35,000 kilograms each. Now we're kind of messing around with different variations and stuff. But this is, uh, this is realistic. This is, what, this is what retinal does. Another thing that retinal can do is uh, if, if the photon hits off center, it'll also spin. Uh, and, of course, if it hits it the, the other way, if it hits it just right, it'll flex and unflex. That's another way to absorb and release energy. So now, again, on this one, it's important to remember that you can cancel the atomic mass units. Now, here they are getting canceled left and right. Over here, top and bottom. So you have a, uh, Laura, you have a choice of what you want to do for canceling. You, you know, cancel left and right. Or if you're forgetting to the last step, cancel top and bottom. Either way is good. All right, so your answer is uh, 0 0.250 uh, on that one. Now keep your clickers handy because we got some more clicking to do. But I want to review some of the stuff that we talked about last Thursday about space time, uh, coordinates and dimensions in space time, kind of like the TARDIS for Doctor Who. Uh, we construct a coordinate system in order to diagram and calculate speeds and accelerations and whatnot. 
So distances, curvatures, etc., cetera, uh, for various events or between various events. So to do that, you use uh, rectangular coordinates, X, Y, and Z. You know, the, the axes being like the corners of a rectangular box. You know, they're perpen mutually perpendicular. But you could have spherical or curvilinear coordinates. Uh, an example of curvilinear co coordinates is um, uh, the spherical coordinates uh, for Earth. You know, latitude, longitude. You know, and then the distance from the center of the Earth. You know, everything on the surface of the Earth is, you know, plus or minus about 20 kilometers. So we don't really do that, but astronomically you could. And for, you know, for spacecraft, yeah, you definitely have to keep in, into account the distance from the center of the Earth. Now, Einstein said we've got to use time as much more than just a bookkeeping tool. All right. It's... You, you have to consider it the fourth dimension, and therefore, you have to figure out some way to make time have a distance-like uh, behavior or a distance-like quantity, all right? Because his theory was um, that, the, you know, Galileo's grand book of the universe is uh, actually a four-dimensional space-time. So we have to treat time as if it were an X, Y, or Z coordinate. And it's, you know, it's not. It's a time. It's measured in seconds. But you know what? There is, and I'll just ask you to think, there is a distance unit that almost everybody here has heard of that features seconds and other increments of time. You know, measure the distance in a unit that has increments of time in the name of the unit. Think. What would that be? A distance unit that has time in it. Uh, red shirt. Yeah, light years. So go ahead and make a note of that. Um, we, so in other words, we already do it. You know, astronomers do. And did you know that the distance from the Earth to the sun is almost exactly 500 light seconds? It's like 499 point something light seconds. So light seconds, light minutes for the solar system, light years for interstellar and intergalactic distances. Yeah. So here now here's the set of vectors and I have them arranged in stacks so that they're a little bit more compact. Uh, Space-time position, the, the, the position you mark for a certain event, you know, my birthday party at Chuck E. Cheese. All right, so T is the date and X, Y, and Z are the coordinates of ch your, your, your table at Chuck E. Cheese. And I know a lot of you guys like to go to Chuck E. Cheese for your birthday. The vector that you use for dynamics, not position, but for dynamics, you know, the quantity of motion, is got that top slot. You know, we usually put the time or temporal component in the first slot. And then the space component in the second, third, and fourth slot. And momentum, px, py, pz, for instance, are second, third, and fourth slot. And in the top slot, as I mentioned last time, is energy. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So what I want to do is just to stimulate your mind to think. We're going to start thinking in light years here. So I want to uh, uh, start a space-time graph. And we're going to have X axis horizontally, as usual. And then we're going to make the vertical axis uh, our time axis. But we're going to label it as CT, speed of light times time. In other words, light years or light seconds if we want. 
All right, so um, in general, you would just write CT to label the axis. All right, so if you, if you choose uh, light seconds, you know, you'd have, you know, lines of graph paper a certain distance apart. And if you use light minutes, you'd have a little bit bigger uh, distance between your graph paper lines. So let's draw in some graph paper lines. And I'm going to draw in four of them here. Here we go. And try to make them evenly spaced. And evenly spaced means that we have the same C delta T between each of those lines. All right. Now, that's what we would call a partition of the temporal axis. The thing that changes in equal amounts every second of time, every millisecond of time, at the surface of the Earth anyways, is free fall. And so the speed for every second of free fall, you get another 9.8 meters per second. Now, dynamically, that means you have the same amount of momentum for every delta T and for every C delta T. And that means that the impulse formula, F delta T equals delta P, is, is, is comprehensible and understandable using the temporal axis partitioned in equal C delta T's. Because impulse formula has got delta T right in it. All right, so everything's copacetic. And so, so the impulse formula, you know, comes from Newton's second law. And we've used it for modeling interactions, and it's good for that. And what Einstein would say is, all right, this is a law that um, along the horizontal lines of the graph paper, every C delta T vertically, um, I can re, you know, recalculate my results using the impulse formula. If, I mean, if there's a force. Okay, so that accounting, the impulse formula is made for it. Just like that. Nice and easy. Easy as walking through the park. Now, so let's put a big old check mark next to this baby. Now, the other thing I want to do, let me get rid of my C delta T's. Let's put in some vertical lines and try to make them squares. Here's mine. In other words, equal delta X's. All right. Now, the equal C delta T's going up. Uh, the impulse equation is perfect for that. So now you have to ask yourself the question, all right, in four dimensions, what law of physics is there that is really nice with consider, you know, when you account for things spatially with delta x's along the x-axis, you know? Impulse formula makes perfect sense when you go in equal increments of time. Because every second of free fall, you get the same amount of momentum downward. All right? Now, what do you get when you, when you have a, a horizontal force, a constant horizontal force, and, you know, what changes? For every meter of a constant force, uh, you know, what's your... What's your law of physics for that? So that's what we're going to talk about. And the answer to that is uh, kinetic energy. The corresponding or analogous law for equal delta x's, and this is actually a general result, F delta x equals delta of something called the kinetic energy. Now, we call that delta of kinetic energy. We call that the work capital W, and let me warn you and, add, and give you a, a warning and an alert. When you're on a problem like this um, and you, you want to read carefully for the context to make sure that you're thinking capital W for work, the change in the kinetic energy, 
uh, and not capital W for the weight force. All right. Now, sometimes you have to do both in the same problem. So you just got to be careful about your symbols and what they mean and stuff. We use capital W for both of those. Now, the formal definition, you know, in the, in the impulse formula, we got delta P on the right-hand side. And P is equal to MV. On the right-hand side of the, the work formula, we have delta KE. So the definition for KE is a little bit different. It's one-half MV squared. And this is the thing that changes equally for every meter of forced motion. So if you're under a friction force, every meter or every centimeter of horizontal motion under friction, you lose a certain amount of kinetic energy. All right? On your way up through the atmosphere, a baseball, a pop-up, every meter you go upward, you lose some one-half mv squared because you're slowing down. And it just happens to be that every meter you lose the same amount of kinetic energy for every meter on the way up. Now, if you're going as far as the moon, you got to use calculus to figure out the amount of energy that you lose. But for Earth, it's pretty, pretty easy because you know, we're all plus or minus 20 kilometers. So, uh, you know, so uh, delta K is pretty easy to figure out. So the metric unit of work Work is the change in the, K, the kinetic energy. The metric unit is the joule. And it's the same as 1.00 kilogram meters squared per second squared. In fundamental units, kilograms, meters, and seconds. Now, Rachel, you may be thinking to yourself, Dr. B, what's, who's joule? Is that a guy? Is that a, is that a scientist? that they named the unit of work after? And the answer to that is yes, it is. Joule was a, a scientist in the 1800s in Britain, and he was really smart. And he figured out an awful lot of thermal energy and potential energy and kinetic energy concepts uh, during his, his, uh, his lifetime in the 1800s. Very interesting guy. And so they named the unit of the energy in the metric system after him. Kind of like Sir Isaac Newton, the unit of force, Newton. Uh, there's no unit, th th you know what, and there should be. There sh you know, it should be, you know, the, uh, who should they name it after? The Euler, E-U-L-E-R, Euler's, Euler's method. The oil, for a unit of uh, momentum, kilogram meter per second. But for some reason, they didn't do that. But they have it for joules. So for this instance, you know, this is a one kilogram. So this is a liter bottle of water moving at one meter per second. One half mv squared. So one half times 1.00 kilograms times 1.00 meters per second quantity squared. So the units are meters squared per second squared. All right, you gotta, you got to square everything. And in this particular case, it works out to 0 0.5 joules. Now, here's another example. Uh, w equals F delta X. So if you, if you have a force acting for one meter, a force of one Newton acting for one meter, that's the F delta X part of the equation, right? So a Newton meter, Nm, yeah, that's the same as a joule. So make a note of that. Uh, a joule is the same as 1.00 kilogram meter squared per second squared. And that's the same as 1.00 Newton meters. Now, why do I make that distinction? The reason I do that, Sawyer, is so that sometimes when you're doing a calculation, you want to cancel kilograms, well then you'd want to use this one, 1.00 1 kilogram meters squared per second squared, because it's got the kilograms right there. You just got to cancel them. Sometimes you want to cancel a force, you know, a number of newtons. Well, in that case, ding, I'll just go over here, see? 
My, my phone just dinged. See? Uh, you want to go over here, 1.00 Newton meters. Perfectly fine. That's an energy. But it's a, a form of the unit joule that allows you to cancel joules or cancel distance. You know, so like if you know the stopping distance, figure out the stopping force. Okay. You know, do your work equation, figure out, uh, you know, the stopping force by canceling Newtons left and right. right? And you're going to have some practice with that. But let's define another kind of energy, potential energy. And the reason we're doing this is because potential energy is the energy of position. And in gravitational freefall at the surface of the Earth, every meter of upward motion, you lose a certain amount of kinetic energy. But if you're already one meter up and you're at rest, you know, you're holding a water balloon up, you know, a meter above or 10 meters up above the, you know, the surface of the sidewalk or something, you know, you're leaning out the window or something from the second floor, and you get your water balloon up there, it'll turn into kinetic energy as soon as you release it. So, the, and it has that potential energy because of position. So let's think about a baseball. On the way up, it loses kinetic energy. If we define gravitational potential energy as minus F delta X or in the case of free fall, minus F delta Y and the weight force being mg. So for instance, gravitational potential, GPE, minus mg delta Y. If we define that that way, then we can model the arc of the baseball as an exchange of energies. Now, we've already done exchange of momenta for collisions. You know, the boxcars and, uh, you know, skateboarders, they exchange momenta, right? Exchange of energies and free falls, it, it, it's, it's a natural, okay? So for every meter, for instance, every joule that you lose in kinetic energy on the way down, on the way up, I mean, uh, goes into a joule of potential energy. And then vice versa... A joule of potential energy on the that you lose on the way down gets converted straight over to kinetic energy. Right? So it's always a one-to-one -one trade off. Whatever the potential energy loses, the kinetic energy gains. That's on the way down. On the way up, whatever the kinetic energy loses, the potential energy gains. Alright, so as a result of that, the sum of kinetic and potential is a constant. And that constant is known as the total mechanical energy. And it gets the symbol capital E. So at every position, you know, once you, you, uh, you know, hit the ball with a baseball bat, it's going to have a certain number of joules of kinetic energy. And on the way up, it's going to lose all of, oh, well, all of them if it's a straight pop-up. If it's, if it's heading for the outfield, you're still going to have some horizontal uh, velocity. You won't lose any of that. But your vertical velocity, you're going to lose all that, and then it's going to start coming back down, and you're going to start getting joules again. But they'll always add up to the same number. And we're going to do an example of that. Uh, and then dismiss hopefully a little bit early today just to give you guys a mental break because that was pretty pretty rugged that homework nine I know a lot of people were working hard on that so let's talk about energy levels in Earth's gravitational field next time you're using your patented wrestling move like this guy well, well let's work something out a little simpler than that so let's think about a, a two-liter bottle of Mountain Dew. All right. You buy one of those down at the grocery store, down at Publix or Aldi or something. And let's say that you've got it up at 10 meters. So you're up on uh, the fourth floor, 10 meters up, or the third floor, 10 meters up. 
and you're holding it there out the window, and you're going to drop it down to your buddy, and hopefully he's going to catch it, right? And it's got, you know, you're holding it, so it's got zero kinetic energy. But how much potential energy does it have? In other words, how much, how much kinetic energy will it get by the time it gets down to your buddy? Because whatever potential and energy it has when you're up there 10 meters up in the sky, it's all going to go to kinetic by the time you get down to the bottom. By the time you're down here and your buddy catches it, hopefully, uh, it'll have a lot of kinetic energy and no potential energy. So let's figure this out. Remember what the formula is? GPE equals minus mg delta y. And your delta y here, you're up above the surface, 10. So delta y is positive 10. And in that formula, I have to use g equals minus 9.8 meters per second squared. So let's calculate it. What is the GPE of a two kilogram bottle, Mountain Dew, at y equals 10.0 meters above the sidewalk or above your buddy that's going to catch it? And it's going to be a positive number. The formula has a minus, it's minus mg delta y. So the minus sign out in front, and then the G has a minus 9.8. It's got a, so minus times minus is positive. All right, so your, your delta Y is positive 10 in this one. Now on your way down, your delta Y is negative. You're losing elevation. And that means whatever you gain on the way up, you surrender on the way back down. It's one of those situations, you know, the, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. So he's on the way back down, he's taketh away the potential, and he's giveth uh, kinetic energy. But first we've got to figure this one out. 30 seconds. Minus mg delta y. Minus mg delta y. Minus mg delta y. Minus mg delta y. Why oh why is it delta y? Because work is F delta X. <laughs> 10 seconds, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. All right, good. I'll stop singing. Trying to. All right, most of you guys got it. 196. All right, so let's go back to our table and let's fill, fill that one in. All right? So now at the top, so you're 10 meters up. Your buddy's going to catch it. You're holding on to it, so no kinetic energy. It's all potential, 196 joules. All right? Now, what that tells you is your total energy is 196. Capital E. It's the sum of kinetic and potential at any elevation. So once you have it there, you have ditto marks all the way down. Any elevation you care to write about, capital E is going to be 196. Now, you can calculate GPE at any elevation, then figure out kinetic energy, because you have total mechanical energy. You know, so you have an equation capital E equals kinetic plus potential. So if you have two of those items, you can figure out the third. Okay. So just before impact, for instance, Y is zero. You've lost all that potential energy. So now GPE is zero. And guess who's got all the energy? The kinetic energy. 
And this is the speed. So there's the, that's the one half MV squared for your buddy before he catches that bottle. And you know, that would be a very difficult catch to make a two meter or a two kilogram bottle of, uh, uh, he'd have to have really good hands. All right. So the total energy, ding, 196. Matter of fact, it's uh, 196 all the way down. Here's a di slightly different table. GPE is in the second column instead of the third column. But yeah, so just make ditto marks all the way down. As soon as you get the total energy at any one level, ding, it's ditto marks all the way down. And then you can calculate column number two at any elevation you like, you know, like nine meters. We, I mean, we just did it for 10. It was just as easy to do it for nine. Slightly smaller, slightly smaller potential energy, but that's because after it falls a meter from 10 down to nine, it's got some kinetic. So these two numbers here at level nine meters, there's gonna be a number here, it's gonna be less than 196, and there's gonna be a number here for kinetic energy, and it's be, gonna be greater than zero, because you're moving now. And in fact, you're all kinetic energy by the time you get down to here at the very bottom. Now, um, homework, oh my goodness, we're dismissing early. This is payback for the time last week when I was <laughs> trying to dismiss early and didn't. Homework 10, you'll have a little bit of work with this, a table just like this. Okay, you're dismissed. I'll see you uh, next time. See you on Thursday.